Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll start because I'm always prone to overrun a little bit, so I don't want to start too late. Um, I've been suffering from a cold for the last about two weeks now, I think, and it's still not gone away, but so please excuse any unscheduled, co incoherent mumblings that you get from me. It's because of the cold rather than just the confused ideas. There may be confused ideas as well, but well, most of them are, are because of the cold. So if there's, anything you, if there's anything you can't understand that you can't tell what I say, uh, please just wave at me and I can repeat it. Okay? I don't want to plow on and have people uh, kind of sitting there. What's he talking about now? Okay. My name's uh, Derek Taylor. Uh, and uh, I, one of my jobs in the uh, Nottingham University is... I'm on the advisory board of the Geoenergy Research Centre and therefore I'm uh, doing this lecture on the behalf of the Geoenergy Research Centre this afternoon. Maybe a little bit, of, a couple of words about my background for those who haven't read the publicity. Uh, I started my line a geologist, I graduated from Nottingham University, did a PhD at Nottingham University, when Nottingham University had a geology department um, in the good old days. And then I worked for British Petroleum uh, for five years, then I worked for the OECD in Paris for seven years, and then I spent 25 years working for the European Commission uh, in a variety of roles, nearly all of which related to energy. And for the last five years of my career in the European Commission, I was energy advisor, with particular uh, responsibilities uh, for clean coal technologies, carbon capture and storage, and anything to do with energy and environmental issues. Okay, so I've done a lot of coal, a lot of environment, and the, the mixture of the two. Basically what I'll talk about this afternoon is those are the points, there are nine of them. Uh, so I'll work through these as, we go, as I go along uh, to tell you the importance of coal, about how much we have and how much we think we have, the economic benefits of it, the environmental impacts of coal, because there are a number as you undoubtedly know, the biggest one being greenhouse gas emissions, uh, so I'll talk about those, I'll talk about the European Union's emission trading system, because that's the driver for the energy and climate policy to a certain extent. Security of supply, which is becoming increasingly important. Carbon capture and storage, which may be the saviour for the coal sector. And then a few conclusions at the end. World coal consumption, as you can see, is still increasing. There's a lot of pressure on coal because of its carbon dioxide emissions but its use is increasing all the time. So it's, we're at record levels of coal consumption now. Energy mix, this is in the world. Energy consumption, the largest one of course is oil, mainly because of transport. But the second one is coal, and it's very close to oil now in the graphic followed by natural gas. All these three have increased strongly over the last 40 years. Hydro is creeping up, though in most parts of Europe now we have reached the capacity we can do for hydro. We, we use most of our good hydro capacity in Europe. Nuclear was coming up and now it's kind of gone down a little bit, uh, but only slightly. And it will probably come up again, thanks in particular to China and hopefully the UK. And then others which are basically other renewables, such as wind power, solar, etc. They're starting to make inroads into the energy mix. There's the future, total future energy consumption. This is from the BP statistical review. I tend to favour BP because I used to work for them and it also is a very good uh, statistical review of world energy or I believe so. 
you see the total world energy and they predict it will continue to steadily increase this is for the next 20 years and probably long beyond that uh, coal will flatten out a bit they think coal will flatten out a bit about after 2020 but will still continue to increase though it's on a smaller percentage role in our energy production this is what's producing our electricity at the moment and as you can see coal is the main producer of electricity in the world and by source electricity generation by source for electricity coal again is the main source of electricity in the world and for the EU sorry this is the European Union a lot of my data is for the European Union because I worked there for so long it's what I'm most used to and most happy with and easy with natural gas is increasing its share and oil is there so nearly 50% of our electricity is still generated from fossil fuels renewables are increasing but a large part of that renewables is still hydro this is the trend over the last 10 years or so with solid fuels the blue line is now the highest from the electricity generation followed by nuclear followed by renewables now which is a major change since the beginning of this century gas keeps goes up and down up and down a bit you see it's gone in there it was going down and it may well be coming up again now and oil and oil products are gradually going out of the electricity mix so the main re the main basis for these slides is to show you how important coal is to the world energy situation in particular how important it is in the production of electricity including in Europe coal reserves there are two ways of calculating coal reserves I won't bore you with them one is the German Geological Society and the other is the World Energy Council um, they have two different estimates of how much reserves we have one is 1,052 billion tonnes and the other one is 892 billion tonnes you don't know where they can lose 170 billion tonnes but there is, there is a difference if you want to look at the, uh, how they calculate it and where they find the differences annual production is 7.8 billion tonnes a year that's the annual production of coal now so at the present rate of production we have reserves that will last over 100 years between 113 and 135 years that's the known reserves now reserves basically are those resources those coal beds those coal deposits that can be mined using present technology at a price at a cost which and marketable the, the amount of reserves tends to vary with price of course sometimes if the price is drops then the reserve numbers will drop because you can't recover quite as much but the, that's roughly we've got over a hundred years of reserves at the present rate of production so we're quite good off for some quantities of coal and when you look at coal resources it's even more dramatic uh, we have 17 times more than the present coal reserves resources are things we know exist but we not studied them enough yet to work out their economics or, or maybe they're slightly too expensive to mine at this present time but we know they exist but we haven't delineated them fully so coal is very abundant and if it's 17 times more than the present reserves that gives us so in my calculations between 1500 and 2000 more years of coal to burn coal resources account for two thirds of all the non-renewable energy sources there's a small graphic there to show that can I ask a question? sure about the, um, about the, so 
Yeah. yeah. It's usually in the million tons of oil equivalent, yeah. It's usually in tons of oil equivalent. Now I must admit, I can't remember uh, what, how this was done, but it's usually in tons of oil equivalent. Coal production. The top line is the amount of coal produced in the world. You've seen this at the beginning. And then the red line is Asia and Australasia, and the green line is China. And you can see China accounts now for nearly half of the world's coal production. These are the major exporters in the world, and number one nowadays, which wasn't the case a few years ago, is Indonesia, with Australia slipping to second place, and Russia in third, the USA in fourth. There was a list of top 15 uh, producers in the world there. This is just basically for information but it also shows you this, the scatter of coal resources through the world. A lot of countries have a lot of coal. Thermal coal prices. One of the kind of fallacies of coal is, is that it's pretty constant price and not much variation. However, apart from that big peak in about 2007-2008, uh, it's bounces along quite happily at about somewhere around 60 US dollars uh, per ton. The big peak there was caused by a number of factors. Uh, that part of the decade was a lot of uh, commodities had peaks, a lot of peaks in the prices of commodities. The oil price went up, which made recovery and shipping of coal much more expensive, quite a bit more expensive and, uh, and of course there's the people panic buy because they see the price goes and they buy before it goes too high and push it up even higher but it's come back down now and it's kind of bobbing along quite happily at around 60, slightly lower there um, dollars a tonne LCOE, low levelized cost of electricity. Levelized cost of electricity. Okay, this is basically when you, uh, a coal fired power plant, for example, you build it, you start building it, it's, you start paying a lot of money up front because you've got to build it. Then, after you've built it, you've got to operate it. And the operational cost, the largest one, is usually the cost of the coal. Okay, so these levelized costs, this is an average cost of electricity being produced by different types of plants. Now this is in OECD countries because this is a study uh, from the OECD NEA, Nuclear Energy Agency, and the OECD International Energy Agency. The two energy agencies of the OECD did this study. This is, I think, the seventh study uh, now uh, that they've done it's just uh, I think it's published officially published this month but it is already available um, certainly the executive summary is available so with a lot of these numbers I got these numbers out of the, the final report and the arrows indicate the median value and the blue bars indicate the range of costs it's levelized costs and these are costs to generate one uh, kilowatt of electricity. Okay? They're all for generating a kilowatt of electricity, these are costs. Okay? And you see, coal is one of the lowest ones. The lowest one actually is, uh, well, large hydro can be, but it's also got a massive range. So the ranges are very different. Large hydro offshore wind is still uh, not very attractive uh, from the point of view of cost of generating electricity, but onshore wind can be. And as you see, the median value for onshore wind is lower than for any other source now. But these are very sensitive to location, of course, and which uh, impacts how much wind you get. 
and so this is the price per unit of electricity generated. Sorry, is that, is that big subsidies? Uh, yeah, um, no. 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 The numbers come from all the different member states of the OECD, the member countries of the OECD. Uh, so some of them do, some of the reasons for the differences will be the way they make the calculations. So I'm not excluding that nobody does subsidies in these, or some are written into them. But in theory, no, there's no, and there's nothing like the strike price for nuclear in the UK and things like this. This is not taken into account. But there is, in the case of coal, there is a carbon price included in the coal price and the same for gas there's a price for carbon which we'll come to carbon pricing later this by the way is, is an excellent report if you want to learn about how the costs are it's, I, I would strongly recommend you look at the report in the executive summary it is free on the internet from the IEA and the NEA's websites However, while coal is a reasonable price, we have a lot of it, and it's very important, it does have very significant environmental in impacts. You know, the mining, transport, and the use of coal has a number of very significant impacts, and health impacts as well. I think there are still more people die mining coal than any other energy source. Not least of these impacts, of course, results from the emissions during the burning of the coal. And a major effort has been undertaken to reduce a number of these particulate matter, nitrous oxides, sulfur oxides. So a lot of work has been put into reducing the amount of emissions, but little work has been done in reducing the amount of carbon dioxide. And nowadays, carbon dioxide is the one thing we are most concerned about from the burning of fossil fuels in general. This is, you know, I, I didn't put this up for people to study and look at. You can get, I'm sure you'll be able to get a copy of the whole thing from, from the website afterwards. It's just to show you um, the, the, the correlation between industrial activities, in particular uh, burning uh, coal, uh, but other energy sources as well, and climate change and I don't think anybody or very few people now very few people now doubt there is a link between energy and climate change mainly through the amounts of carbon dioxide that are emitted and that carb climate change is with us already of course and uh, we don't think it's going to be easy if, if at all possible to reverse but we can hopefully slow it down considerably. Now these are the global greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide from fossil fuel use is the biggest culprit. Fossil fuel use which is not just coal of course it's gas and oil is carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels is the largest source of gre greenhouse gas emissions. And by source energy supply is the largest single source uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. These are the different emissions from the different sources of energy, different main sources of energy. And the green uh, blob at the top, this is not a very new slide, I, I admit, but I've never seen any newer slide that uh, summarises it quite so well. The green part at the top, blob at the top of the column is the difference between different technologies depending on the different generation technologies used, what sort of coal plant you use, this is the sort of amounts of carbon dioxide you get per kilowatt hour from a coal fired power plant and oil fired natural gas renewables and from nuclear. The numbers for renewables uh, where you people say well renewables don't have carbon dioxide um, this is not a biomass burn. So biomass, of course, does produce carbon dioxide. 
Well, CO2 emissions by region. Um, well, I think we all know that China is probably now the main source of carbon dioxide, um, followed by the US uh, as a country, um, and then the European Union has considerably less than the US at 11.9 percent share of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. This is the European Union's carbon dioxide emissions over the last uh, 23 years, I think it's at that table shows. So you see they are declining from 1990 to present day. They're still declining in 2015, I believe. Um, a lot of this is because of the technology changes that were brought about by the enlargement of the European Union, by bringing in a lot of the countries from Eastern Europe. You'll see in 2005, after the enlargement, when we brought in a lot of new European countries, a lot of countries into the European Union, uh, the, carbon, the carbon dioxide emissions went down because a lot of the more polluting industries were closed or extensively updated and improved efficiency. But we are coming down, not so much because of technology change as such, but a lot of that reason for the decline, of course, since the, about 2006 onwards as well is because of the recessions we had and uh, we, we probably might well pick up again uh, as, in, as we go into the future. So we're not uh, out of the woods at all and it's a long way to go. And the European Union has a policy on energy now and to achieve the energy union we have to move away from an economy driven by fossil fuels based on a centralised approach. That's just a quote from earlier this year. It's the Commission's statement on energy union. The member states of the European Union, which of course includes the UK, still, the member states have agreed to reduce their greenhouse gases by at least 40% by 2030. This is relative to the 1990 levels we saw earlier. 40% is a significant amount. That means those sectors covered by the emission trading scheme, the ETS, will actually be required to cut their emissions by at least 43% by 2030. And these sectors include 11,000 power stations and industrial plants. In fact, they're most of the locations where coal is burned. To 2050, it's even more severe because it's been agreed that by 2050, we'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions by between 80 and 95 percent, which requires the power sector, the power sector to reduce its reduce its emissions by between 93 and 99 percent, which is pretty well close, 99 percent in the power sector reduction will mean you pretty close to zero. Also, the industrial sector, which also uses quite a lot of coal, will also have to reduce its emissions dramatically. This, of course, will have drastic consequences for the future of coal. The emission trading system is the main policy instrument in Europe for trying to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. It's laudable in its objectives because it's trying to reduce emissions in an economic way. So a kind of least cost fashion. However, it's incredibly complex and getting increasingly so in its execution. I've been involved, I was involved with the ETS system from when it was first conceived in the Commission uh, and followed it closely, did some work on, on a number of the different countries and uh, estimates of how much carbon dioxide they need and it is increasingly complex. But, but in simple, it's a cap and trade system. You agree a maximum amount of carbon dioxide at some point in the future and then you sell allowances to allow the 
countries and power plants in those countries to emit carbon dioxide. The number of allowances that are sold, however, reduce annually. And the idea is to, to achieve the emissions expected for that year. At the present rate, the reduction, the rate of reduction is 1.74% per year, but it will increase after 2020. It's the largest international system. The European one is the largest one for trading greenhouse gases. It covers not only carbon dioxide, but also nitrous oxide and perfluorocarbons. It operates in all uh, 28 member states of the European Union and in the three EFTA countries. And it covers around 45% of the EU's total greenhouse gas emissions. A lot of the arrests are, are from uh, transport, which is much more difficult uh, to put under the ETS system, if not impossible. Now it also includes aircraft operators, which is new. By putting a price on carbon, the ETS is designed to incentivise a switch to lower carbon or zero carbon emitting technologies. We're trying to incentivise that by having a price on carbon. You tend to, oh, the idea is to favour the non carbon dioxide producing technologies. And it also hopes to improve the efficiency of energy generation and use. If you can improve your boilers, you can improve uh, different other parts of the power plants, you can increase your efficiency and therefore reduce your carbon dioxide. And to bring about greater innovation in the energy sector. The energy sector uh, is we're trying to push the energy sector to innovate quicker uh, than it is been, has been doing and to bring about these changes in the most cost-effective, least cost manner. That is the idea, that's the ETS objectives. I say laudable in the objectives, but as you see the price of the EU ETS allowances dropped dramatically from a high of just over 30 euros uh, down to present, well it went down to about 4 euros or even lower, briefly. It's now back up at 8 euros 20. Now, I'm not, I don't like predicting the future, apart from the fact that we usually prove wrong, of course, um, and, but it sometimes gives people the wrong impression. My belief is the ETS, however, will continue to rise from that point. I can see no reason why the ETS price will not increase steadily in the future. It's widely realised that the price of an allowance under the ETS is still far too low at 8 euros per tonne of carbon. It's too low to bring around about the objectives of the ETS system. The reasons for its low price have been widely reported and I am happy to discuss them with anybody that wants to talk about it later. Um, we've analysed it in the Commission in some detail in the past. What we've done this now, or what the Commission has done, is postponed the auctioning of 900 million allowances, for some from last year, some from this year, some from next year in particular, until 2019-2020 in order to try and stabilise the market and to start the price rising again. And the market stability reserve has been proposed that would enter into force in 2019, uh, but this is still waiting for the approval of the European Council. Not everybody wants a market stability reserve, not everybody wants the, the European Emission Trading Scheme. So it's still waiting approval in the Council, or it was last week or two weeks ago. In the meantime, the cap will continue to lower each year. I said presently it's 1.74% a year, but it will go up to 2.2% a year by after 2020. And that will continue. The 2.2% per year lowering of the cap will continue to 2030. And after that we will see 
how far we've got and how far we need to get by 2050 and maybe adjust it further and maybe push it down more again. So, but less and less carbon can be emitted. So there are some implications for the future, clearly. The cap should lower until at least for power in the heavy industry sector. It will reach near zero by 2050. That means very few, if any, of the presently operating coal-fired power plants in the EU will be operating by then. Very few, if any. And given that the design life of a coal-fired power plant is now around 40 years and sometimes longer, who will take the decision to build a new one under the emission trading system? Who will be allowed to build one under the emission trading system? This is the largest CO2 emitter in Europe. This is uh, Belhatov, a uh, lignite fired, fired power plant in Poland. There's the lignite field in front of it. I like the photograph I was there when it was taken. In fact, it might be one of mine. But uh, it's quite an impressive plant. The saddest thing about this plant is the, the new plant up the side. On the left-hand side of the picture, there is a new uh, 800 megawatt unit with its big cooling tower next to it. And this was designed to be a carbon capture and storage demonstration plant. It was modified to make, it, make the carbon capturable from this plant. Unfortunately, the Polish government withdrew their support from it days before the European Commission decided to give it some money to go ahead. Who depends on coal? And I put coal in inverted commas in this case because uh, coal is basically solid fuels in this sense. Uh, it's Poland is the largest one of about 85% of its electricity comes from coal. And the second one is Estonia. A lot of Estonia is not actually coal, as you know it. It's not that black shiny stuff that comes out of the ground. It's oil shale. So Estonia relies on oil shales, which is classified uh, by the agencies and by the Eurostat, the Commission's statistical body, as coal or as a solid fuel. Okay, so this is... But who depends on solid fuels, effectively, for their electricity? And these are the dependencies. Now, a lot of people are still quite surprised that Germany still runs at about 40-odd uh, percent of its electricity comes from coal. And even Denmark has about 35% of its electricity from coal still. So a lot of, um, a lot of surprises there. Greece is main EL, which is Greece. That's mainly lignite. But it's not just about coal, of course, when we talk carbon dioxide. A quick fix for reducing carbon dioxide is, is a switch to gas. It emits less, as you saw from the graphic earlier, carbon dioxide emits less CO2 per kilowatt generated, per kilowatt of electricity generated, than coal does. Nearly half as much, I think. But it also emits carbon dioxide. So it will also, it also comes under the emission trading scheme. And by 2050, gas plants will also have to be emitting no carbon dioxide, or virtually no carbon dioxide. Just as a passing note, the potential of shale gas, in my view, I'm not, I may be alone, but I don't think so, the potential of shale gas in Europe to change the energy economics, uh, I think is quite limited. It's not like the states where you have vast open areas and the people who own the land have an interest in selling you this shale gas from under their land but because in most countries in Europe, if not all of them, uh, you don't have, uh, you can't collect money from a company that takes shale gas from under your house. You can't pay, you don't, they won't pay you by the amount of, it's not your gas, it belongs to the crown of course. Many states are building more renewable capacities, but the potential to switch to renewables is limited in some countries. It's very limited in some countries. If you're not a very windy country, and there's a lot of countries in Europe that are not very windy, and others elsewhere in the world where you don't have strong winds for much of the time, you're not going to build many wind-powered stations. 
if you're not in a sunny climate, there's no reason you're going to be building photovoltaics. But of course the cost may be prohibitive. The cost may be prohibitive. Solar, just another aside, solar voltaics, PV, photovoltaics, solar power, is getting cheaper. It's, it's come down dramatically in price in recent years and it's starting to, of course, because of that it's starting to take a bigger share of the renewable market. However, I saw some interesting facts recently from a, a French institute, scientific institute, that said we are very limited to how much solar we can actually do because of and many of the elements that we need to make the solar panels are, really, are limited, are finite in their amounts. We know this is, of course, it's always finite in its amount, but also there isn't a lot of it in the world. So the more solar panels we use, the quicker we use up our resources, and we run the risk of using up all our resources, natural resources, in making solar, for making solar panels by in 20 or 30 years time. New nuclear plants are suffering from delays. You know that in the case of the UK with Hinkley Point, the Finns know it very much so with Okiloto and the French know it with their new reactor. Everything, the, all the new nuclear plants, at least the, in Europe, the EPRs, the European uh, Pressurised Water Reactors, are running behind schedule, which of course considerably increases their cost and makes them less attractive. In addition to this, there is the security of supply issue. For many years, Europe was a major coal producer. And we've come to think of coal in Europe as an indigenous source of energy. I would imagine if you talk to a lot of people in the street outside, especially see Nottingham is on a coal field, uh, they'll think that coal is a, an indigenous source of energy and that the UK uses its own coal all the time. However, with depleting lower cost reserves and increasing social health and safety requirements in Europe, we cannot now match the prices offered by many external suppliers. And our imports of coal are now increasing dramatically as is our dependency, of course, on external suppliers. This is solid fuels in Europe. Solid fuels, not just coal. The blue line at the top is how much we consume, and the red line at the bottom is our, our imports. Now, it seems a very reasonable, healthy gap, until you realise that much of that gap is covered by lignite, oil shales, and peat. Materials which we do not normally export or import. These are domestically produced. So these are the domestic production. A lot of that gap between our consumption and our imports are by types of fuel that we don't buy from outside. We don't need to and nobody will do so because it's too costly to ship long distances and large quantities. The UK, as I said, people think UK burns mainly its own coal. We are now dependent in the UK on imports for 88% of the coal burnt in the UK is imported. This is the origin of the hard coal imports into Europe. These are into Europe. You see now our largest supplier of coal is Russia. Second is Colombia, and the third one is the USA. Historically, Australia and South Africa were our main suppliers of coal, but that no longer is the case. Russia, Colombia, and the USA can sell us coal cheaper, and therefore that's where we are buying our coal from. Not just coal, of course. We import most of our oil and gas. These are our major importers, the five main importers of oil into Europe. Well, the main one, as you can see there by far, is Russia, that sells us 
almost as much as anywhere as all the Middle Eastern countries put together. From the point of view of gas, we have two predominant suppliers, which is again Russia and slightly less from Norway. So you see, Russia supplies us with our most of our coal, and most of our coal imports, so it's the majority supplier of coal, it's the majority supplier of oil, and it's the majority supplier of gas. So no wonder people start to get concerned when Mr. Putin reaches for the gas tap. Energy dependency, there you go, solid fuels, the solid fuels, I said, a lot of this is solid fuels and not imported because that's the lignite and peat. But hard coal, the black stuff, shiny stuff, is 62% now we're importing of hard coal. So you see the numbers also for oil and gas and petroleum products. So and 50, nearly over 53% of our energy is now imported into Europe, fuels. Where do we go from here? Carbon dioxide is a waste product of burning coal and also a waste product from burning other fossil fuels. But we cannot continue to pump it out into the atmosphere, of course, because of climate change. But we can't stop burning these fuels, at least for some decades. We can't stop. We're hooked onto coal. It's a habit we can't break. So if we want to keep burning coal, if we want to keep burning, building more power plants to burn coal and gas, we need to do capture the carbon dioxide and dispose of it. Or store it, if we're being polite, but dispose of it is what we want to do because it's a waste form and we don't want it for anything else. So we want it somewhere where it can't affect our atmosphere can't affect the climate of the planet. The only technology we have at this time to do this on any sort of significant scale is carbon capture and storage, known as CCS. What is CCS? Uh, this is a very schematic picture, but you see a power plant by the side of the sea, and then a pipe and it with a, its capture, its carbon capture technology attached to it, and a pipeline that runs out and pumps it deep down underground into, the, in, under the, into what usually saline aquifers or uh, gas reservoirs, oil reservoirs, which are depleted and therefore quite, quite a lot of space in them to store carbon dioxide. These are just diagrammatic, this is just an idea for those who haven't uh, done anything about carbon capture and storage yet. It's the, basically the, the basic a way of uh, capturing is shown on the left. It's, it's amine capture and, uh, and, and regenerating the amine to get the carbon dioxide. You take it out of the flue gas, usually. Then you transport it, mainly through pipelines, or you can transport it by ship. And then you pump it uh, deep underground, at least 800 metres. Uh, and then, then it will stay in what's called a supercritical uh, form. We have the picture, the bottom picture is one place where it's actually being done, which is called Sleipner in the North Sea, run by Statoil, the Norwegian oil company, and they're presently pumping one million tonnes of carbon dioxide under the sea. Or, oh, into the rocks under the sea, not under the sea. Carbon dioxide is a technology for which all the components we already have. We've demonstrated that we can capture, transport and store carbon dioxide. Though so we've seldom done this at one facility. And not on a full commercial scale yet. It's also a technology which is poorly understood, unfortunately, by the man in the so-called man in the street. And therefore, it, and, and in particular the storage aspects, the fear of having carbon dioxide pumped under your house in case it ever comes out again, is perceived by many to carry an unacceptable risk. We don't have, in, you're lucky in the UK that not having too much uh, uh, social upheaval about the carbon capture and storage because 
from the start your carbon capture and storage in the UK will be done somewhere under the North Sea but in those countries which have no direct access uh, to the North Sea uh, they're looking at disposing under land it's cheaper to do it under land but of course then you've got people around and they don't like people pumping gas under their house even if it's uh, an inert gas so regulatory bodies are finding it difficult to finalise the necessary legislation for underground storage the European Commission had a, I think a good try to do this a few years ago with its CCS directive which is mainly on storage but it still has to be revised and reviewed and revised again in order to iron out a lot of niggles and to get some of the technical difference changes uh, incorporated so some technical societal and legislative issues remain before we can fully deploy start to deploy carbon capture and storage as I say all parts of the CCS chain can be achieved but the greatest challenge is the location and the development of storage sites and this step is technically possible and a lot of people at, uh, nearby here in, British, in the British Geological Survey BGS work on CCS and they can tell you a lot more about the possibilities of storing in the North Sea than I can um, but it's, so it's technically possible presents the most important financial risk is, is related to actual storage and of course in many places I say the strongest societal challenge because of people's concerns about it not in the UK though. the development and operation of pilot storage and test sites such as the, the Geoenergy Research Centre test site out at Sutton Bonington SB I think you still call it um, can and do help in meeting these challenges they're very important in this process to help meet the challenges to convince the politicians to convince the public of the safety and the achievability of storage but a positive decision on a large scale demonstration plant requires the prior identification of a storage site nobody is going to start capturing large quantities of carbon dioxide if they don't know where they're going to put it once they've captured it you can't store it just on site for several years with large quantities the quantities are too large so you've got to dispose of it as quickly as possible so you need the storage site before you do anything else In this, and so storage is the key factor for CCS industry has been far too slow in taking up and building on the wide range of research data on storage provided by many highly professional institutes including I say BGS throughout the world benefits and cost of CCS CCS is capable of reducing carbon emissions from coal and gas by over 90% take, can take 90, over 90% of the carbon dioxide out of the flue gases up to 99% it could it could extend the period during which the world could continue to use or rely on coal without accelerating climate change and it could if used in conjunction with biomass i.e. burning uh, coal to, or you just burning biomass and collecting the carbon from carbon dioxide from the biomass burn you can actually lower atmospheric carbon levels you'd have to do a lot of burning to do it but you can actually lower it, you can get negative emissions of carbon dioxide if you use biomass in your burn and then capture the carbon dioxide and dispose of it this is one of the sad things about the recent decision by Drax not to continue to support the White Rose project in Yorkshire the White Rose project is the UK's, probably the UK's um, priority for CCS at the moment in time but the utility has decided not to continue its financial support which is a big pity because they were going to use bio, uh, biomass to burn and therefore we were going to get negative emissions of, CC, of carbon dioxide or some of the emissions would be negative but hopefully the white rose will continue to go ahead it just needs some money to come in and help finance it 
However, CCS will add significantly to the cost of producing electricity from coal and gas because you need energy from your plant to recover the carbon dioxide from the amine once you've taken it out of the gas and there's also so it adds, can add 30-40% to the cost of generating electricity The Commission has a number of very specific proposals for new legislation in the energy sector, two of which are particularly relevant to coal passing legislation to increase gas and electricity supply security and other measures to reduce Europe's resilience, reliance, sorry, reliance on dominant suppliers. Maybe coal could make some form of comeback under that. You never know because we want to get electricity supply security. Everybody knows now in which we rely on electricity for everything. You can't go through your day without electricity now. We need it to be secure. And to be secure, we need it uh, to be available all times we want it. And we can't uh, take too many risks with how we produce it. So coal could still have a role because it gives us some diversification of suppliers, some diversification of technologies to do it. We also have, on the other side, passing legislation to ensure the 2030 climate and energy targets this is the 40% reduction or 43% reduction under the ETS by 2030 are actually reached. But these pieces of legislation are in the pipeline but not yet on the table. Conclusions. The longer you work in the energy sector, the more you realise that we need all the energy sources that we can use, all of them, to meet our future energy requirements. We can't turn around and say, we don't like renewables, and we don't like nuclear, we don't like coal, get, let's get rid of that and concentrate. We can't do that. It is just not going to be possible. Not going to be possible. So we, we need them all. However, in spite of the role coal has played in the past, in our development, and it has played a vital role in in the Industrial Revolution and the development of industry in England and the rest of Europe and in the rest of the world even. In spite of all this, without the large-scale demonstration and deployment of carbon capture and storage, the future of coal burning in the power and heavy industry sector is increasingly uncertain in the medium term and fading rather quickly in the longer term. So, on that not very bright note, I'm happy to answer, try and answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. That's a very interesting uh, seminar indeed. Um, I was very interested to see that your, in your levelised cost graph, you showed that nuclear energy was on a par with coal in terms of its levelised cost. That was a, came as a real surprise because we're, we're told time and time again that you know the, the the Achilles heel of nuclear is its cost. And I saw towards the end of your, uh, of your, of your presentation, you, were, you said that CCS will increase the cost of uh, coal-fired energy by 30-40%. So does that mean that the, the, the playing field is, is not level as, uh, as it stands between coal and nuclear? It seems to, it's likely to get even less level if uh, CCS costs are factored in. Yeah, I, the 30-40% is what is the present situation now. Um, we would hope that the, that percentage will come down because as the technology improves and things like this and economies of scale and then we get a number of uh, uh, storage sites up and operating and then it's just enough. So we would hope that we will, we will come, that cost will come down 
there is an element in that graph, as I said, for the carbon price. There is a carbon price element in the graph for the for coal and for gas already. So, but for nuclear, yeah, the nuclear people always talk about the cost of nuclear, but that's because of the front end cost, the construction cost. The early investment is very high. That's no doubt about it. They're the most expensive plants per kilowatt installed in the world. Um, but once you've loaded, once you've built a nuclear power plant, the fuel cost is very small. Whereas with coal, the fuel cost, on, as far as the operation goes, is quite high and quite variable. And with gas plants, they're even more variable and even higher. Uh, with nuclear plants, the price of fuel, one, is only a small part of the operational cost. And, the sp and it's, only, it's only a small part in terms of uh, amount in total. And it's only a relatively low cost for a fuel for a reactor for a year. Uh, so you, your operating costs dry up very quickly and uh, in Germany now I always look amazed at the German government closing the nuclear plants in Germany some of which are only 20 odd years old these are what we would call a cash cow at the moment they're producing, get, getting the in, industry, the utilities a lot of money with very little cost because after 20 years you've covered all your investment costs and after that you're just kind of minting money effectively from nuclear power plants and with the nuclear power plant lifetimes there are 60 years the longer you can push it out the lower your levelised costs are going to be but the only reason that it used to be much lower it used to be by far the cheapest uh, the reason it's come up of course is because uh, regulations that keep getting increasingly it's increasingly regulated and, and stricter regulations for the nuclear sector every time you know, Fukushima, more regulations appear. Uh, Three Mile Island, a lot of regulations appear. Chernobyl, a lot of regulations appear. New regulations all the time, every time there's any sort of incident or accident, there's more regulations. So it increases the cost all the time. A lot more redundancy built into the systems every year. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting lecture. Um, I noticed that none of your uh, 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 figures for uh, uh, carbon dioxide production include the carbon dioxide that's needed or that's produced in making the plant. In other words, even a nuclear plant to make the concrete, to make the steel, significant quantities of carbon dioxide are involved. Significant quantities of carbon dioxide come out, especially when you concrete. Concrete is a big source. Of concrete production is a big source. And cement and concrete production is a big source of carbon dioxide. There is no doubt about it. However, all these plants use concrete. There's basically every plant you see uses concrete. And the amount... I've seen figures, I didn't, they're not included in this graphic, but they, they may be if you look through the full report, but the quantities are relative to the total lifetime of the plant are very low. You know, it's, there's a lot of concrete goes into a nuclear plant, but there's also a lot of concrete going into a, a wind turbine. And you build a lot of wind turbines uh, to, build, to get the same power that you get out of a coal-fired and a nuclear-fired power plant uh, so the, the, the ad, there's no it, the, co the carbon dioxide during construction is relatively insignificant over the period of lifetime of the facility whichever facility it is ok thank you pleasure so I was just wondering about CCS do you think anybody is ever going to take a punt on it and, and fund it properly to enable it to be rolled out because we always seem to get to the stage where the production line it's, it's just about to happen and then somebody pulls out with Drax being the, the next example of it yeah well the, it is uh, Sask Power in Saskatchewan in Canada is now operating uh, a 
coal fire capture and storage plant uh, there are a number of, and I, there's at least one other in the states in the states that's, that's come online and more to come the advantage they have in the states in Canada uh, and is possibly in some other parts of the world but not so much in Europe is they can use the carbon dioxide to enhance oil recovery from existing, uh, from existing wells so an enhanced oil recovery improves your economic case for doing it it doesn't necessarily improve uh, the safety of the storage in fact it might be more of a problem to store in, a, in an, uh, a depleted oil and gas well than it would in a, a special, specifically uh, explored for and delineated uh, saline aquifer under, under 800 metres below the sea under, below the, below the seabed that sort of thing but in Europe yes I mean Europe has, has already said it will give over 300 million uh, euros to the Drax project if the UK will support it it's 300 million is already on the table from the European Commission um, in theory of course uh, the UK has already said they will pay up to 1 billion to support CCS uh, demonstration projects in the UK but it seems to be delaying in coming but the feed studies are still being done for, for Drax and also for Peterhead and hopefully uh, these will show that it, it can be well I'm pretty certain certainly it can be done uh, hopefully this will encourage the government to put them, some money up for both of them I'd like to see both of them funded and the commission will certainly then fund one of them we would hope the commission will fund some more CCS projects uh, under the NER 400 uh, instrument that, but that's not coming for another four or five years that won't be available for another four or five years before that money is available but people do survive in China there are a number of uh, demonstration projects coming along um, I say the states and Canada have been done so I would hope that um, more will appear I, I can't the trouble is with CCS th there is no alternative to CCS if you want to burn coal and, and I've said many times over the last ten years now I would say that coal does not have a future in the, me in the long term that's 2050 if it doesn't do CCS because we can't afford to put the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere it's as simple as that we can't continue to do it we, we will miss, miss the targets for the maximum amounts we can put into the atmosphere and then we will global warming will continue and it could reach the so called tipping point and run away in the future hopefully it doesn't but I think the increasing number of people believe it could well do and unless we capture the carbon dioxide if we wish to continue to burn fossil fuels and if we can get out of cars we can put electric cars on the road but then you need the electricity from some source and if you, that be, increases your electricity demand which re renewables will not be able to cover all electricity demand in the future you're going to have to use fossil fuels but if you're going to use fossil fuels you're going to have to capture the carbon and CCS is the only option at this moment in time so I think it's short sighted uh, by politicians never let it be said that politicians are sometimes short sighted um, but they, I think it's short sighted of them not to take a punt into the future and say we need it and we'll pay for it now to make sure it does work 